Hello. <laughs> Doesn't it seem like our world gets more and more complex every day? It seems like every day we are bombarded with these issues that impact our world or our nation or our community. And many of them can be very challenging to understand. Sometimes they can even seem overwhelming. Now, when life gets overwhelming, it can make sense to try and simplify things. But when we try and simplify complex topics, that can lead to oversimplification. Oversimplification has brought us to a world where today much of what we take in as knowledge, or even worse, what we pass on as knowledge, comes from sound bites that we hear on radio or TV, or from Facebook posts, from tweets limited to 140 characters, or from catchy slogans that are designed to tell us what to think, but not why we should think that way, or even if it's true. Albert Einstein was a man who knew a lot about a lot of complex things, right? And it's Albert Einstein who reminded us to make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. You see, if we really want to understand the pressing issues of our day, we must be willing to embrace their complexities. Let me give you an example. In the response to human trafficking, it's quite common that we see these big numbers about how many people are enslaved in our world. You may have seen some of these numbers before. For many years, the most commonly quoted estimate was 21 million people. This estimate was released several years ago by the International Labor Organization. They are an agency of the United Nations. But then a couple of years ago, a private organization called the Walk Free Foundation released what they call their Global Slavery Index. And they said the number was much higher, as high as 46 million people enslaved. But just last month, the International Labor Organization, in partnership with Walk Free, issued a brand new estimate. They've adjusted the number downward a little bit, now estimating that 40 million people in our world are enslaved. 40 million women, men, and children either enslaved or in what we call slave-like conditions. Now, I have to ask you, what does 40 million people even look like? I have a very difficult time trying to comprehend how massive a number that is. If I try to make sense of it, just, just for my own use, and I try to come up with some sort of analogy, the best that I've been able to come up with, and admittedly, it's not very good, is I look at the entire state of California and realize that the population is roughly 40 million people. If we're curious about how many victims exist only in the United States, there's even more confusion. The Walk Free Foundation, they estimated that there were about 57,000 victims in the United States. But earlier this year, at the University of Texas at Austin, they released their report examining human trafficking only in the state of Texas. And they believe that in Texas alone, there may be as many as 313,000 victims of trafficking. You see, the numbers are all over the place. The fact is, is that we just don't know. Yet we like to take these numbers without any other information or context and push them out to try and inspire people to respond against human trafficking. Do you think it works? I don't think so. And there's also some other problems with these numbers. The first is that we have to realize is that they are broad estimates at best. They are extrapolations based on very limited data. One of the real problems we have in the response to trafficking is that we lack centralized protocols and mechanisms when we can report, when we find an actual victim of human trafficking or we arrest an actual trafficker, or we take that trafficker to court and prosecute them, hopefully convicting them on actual human trafficking charges. These mechanisms do not exist in the United States, nor do they exist globally. The second problem with these numbers is they don't tell us that there's actually a 
a segment of the population that believe these numbers are vastly overinflated and that we have all been spending way too much time, energy, passion, and money in the response to this problem. But from where I stand, the biggest problem with these numbers is they don't tell us anything about human trafficking. They don't even tell us what it is. Human trafficking, or modern slavery, is defined as taking a person and then exploiting their labor or some other services they can perform, or exploiting them through the commercial sex trade, through the use of force or fraud or coercion. Force, fraud, or coercion. Now, force, I think, is a pretty simple concept we can all understand. We can all appreciate how the threat of force or the actual use of force might compel us to do something we would not otherwise normally do. Fraud is also fairly simple to understand because in the context of human trafficking, fraud typically speaks to a financial arrangement between the trafficker and their victim. It's quite common to find situations where the trafficker loans money to the victim and then expects the victim to repay that debt through their labor. But the trafficker has created a financial scheme, an illegal scheme, in which the victim may never be able to repay that money. In some extreme cases, that debt can be passed on to the next generation and even the next. It can go on forever. But coercion... Coercion is a more complex concept because coercion speaks to the victim's state of mind. What's the victim thinking? It's important that we realize that in modern slavery, very few victims are held against their will physically. They are not tied up or in chains. They're not locked behind fences with barbed wire. They are walking freely amongst us. They stay in their situation of exploitation because of the powerful, coercive control held by their trafficker. They stay in situations that you or I would absolutely flee. I only have time to give you one example of coercion, but it's a very powerful example, and it's also a very common example, particularly in that sector of, the human, of human trafficking that, that's the commercial sex trade. A trafficker will tell their victim that they love them. They love them. And they will also tell their victim, if you love me in return, tonight you will go out and you will have sex with as many people as you can for money, and you will bring me back that money so then I can provide us with a warm place to sleep and food to eat. Now, this isn't love. It's a perversion of the concept of love. But we have to understand that this victim may have never, ever known true love in their entire life. They may have never known true caring and compassion. And as a result, they are deathly afraid of losing the love of their trafficker. So as a, as a result, they will go out tonight, they will have sex with as many people as they can, and they will give that money to the trafficker. We need to understand that modern slavery is... It's limited by only two things, the imagination and the coercive skill of the trafficker. If I can think of ways to make money by exploiting you, or you, or you, then all I need to do is figure out what are the coercive buttons I need to push on you, and you, and you. This is why my good friend and colleague Andy, who is a federal prosecutor, and who has successfully prosecuted cases of human trafficking, reminds us that human trafficking is a state-of-mind crime, and that we must all have an appreciation for the coercive power. Everybody involved in the response, from the victim advocate who's going to try and help that victim move on in life free of exploitation, to the police investigator who's going to be talking to that victim and probably wondering, why did you stay in that situation so long? to the prosecutor who has to explain this in court, to the judge, and ultimately to the public at large, because it's from the public that we gain our jurors. 
You see, we all have to have an appreciation for that coercive control that can keep some people in situations that you or I would never dream we could find ourselves in. Now, before I leave you with my closing thoughts, I'd like us all to pause for a moment and just think about some of the other pressing issues of our day that impact our world or our nation or our community. Climate change, energy dependency, health care, immigration, conflicts at home and abroad. All of these and other issues have proponents and opponents, based on our perspective, right? Each of whom are trying to take these complex issues and distill them into simple choices of right or wrong, good or bad, just or unjust, true or false. They, they try to paint us into corners where seemingly our only choices are to either completely agree or completely disagree. They neglect to tell us about the good work that happens when people meet in the middle and share their passion and their knowledge and where real effective change can happen. So I would urge you, if any of these important issues that we're talking about, many of which we are talking about today, if they resonate within you, embrace their complexities. Study them. Really learn. Talk to other people that have different opinions or perspectives than yours. And don't talk about Facebook slogans or snappy slogans. Talk about actions and solutions. Actions and solutions. I'm afraid I have to leave you with... A confession. I do not know how to respond to the problem of 40 million people being enslaved in our world today. That number is too big. It's too vast. It's too complex. But what I would like to leave you with is this. It's what I've learned from my work. And what I've learned is that these are not the numbers we should be focused on. We should be focusing on the number one. Because when my colleagues and I come together and we share our expertise and our passion and we commit to working together, even though we don't always agree on everything, then together we come up with real actions and solutions. Actions and solutions that will help that one victim we're trying to help today or that one prosecutor, or the one investigator who's investigating that one case that might make a really big difference. We can help that one community seeking the one initiative that will reduce the prevalency in their communities. We make a difference one at a time. You see, this is real. This is effective, and this is the best way to respond to modern slavery. So we can all make a difference if we're just willing to embrace these complexities. Because don't you see, it's only when we embrace the complexities that we learn the truth about human trafficking and other things too. Thank you very much.